Romans chapter 10, very famous portion of Scripture. And I'm going to take a little bit of a secondary application, if you will, to this. Now, obviously, the primary application we see here is the Apostle Paul is saying, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He's talking about the physical nation of Israel. He's talking about the Jews. He's saying that, you know, I want them to be saved. And he says, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. They are zealous like the Apostle Paul was. He was zealous in his religion. He was zealous as a Pharisee. He was trying to exceed in that religion, but it was a false religion that was sending him to hell. He believed in his works. That's why it says in verse number 3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness. God's righteousness through faith. They didn't understand it. He said they're ignorant of it. They don't know it. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. What he's stating here is that Israel was trying to achieve their salvation through their works and obedience unto the law. So they haven't submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God, which is faith in Jesus Christ that you don't you can't get saved through the law you have to only, you can only get saved through faith that is the primary implication of this verse and that is that is the real meaning of this verse that's what he's talking about and that is what's most important by the way as well now we as Baptists we believe that Obviously, this is the most important thing is our salvation and being saved and that we don't attain our, our righteousness for heaven through the obedience of the law. But that doesn't mean that obeying the law just goes out the window altogether and that we just don't look at it and, and um, don't study from it and don't learn from it and don't try to live our lives that way. There still is a reason and a place for the law in our lives. And it's not for salvation, but it's to live an honoring life unto God. It's to live an obedient life unto God in a way that we can show our love to God, that we're going to listen to and respect the laws that He has for us. Now, there's a lot of Christians today that have a zeal of God. There are people who are born again and saved that have a zeal of God. And this is the way that I'm going to kind of springboard from this, from this chapter. Obviously, Paul's referring to people who aren't even saved, and he's applying it to, to or and he's, he's talking about salvation. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this verse, and I don't think it's a gross misrepresentation. I think it's, it's legitimate to show that there are people today that they want to serve God. They honestly do. They're saved, they're born again, but they don't have the knowledge. They haven't read the Bible. Maybe, you know, they haven't gone to church. They haven't learned much about the Bible, but they have a zeal. And, you know, maybe they want to do certain things to serve God, but they don't have that knowledge. And as a result, oftentimes people will do things that either they're ineffective, they're not what the Bible says, how to serve God, and, and how we be. And, and sometimes they're even downright sinful, and people will have good intentions, possibly, but they're still sinning against God. Now, I'm fairly certain that everyone here wants to serve God and be zealous towards serving Him and serve Him with, with fervent desire in your heart of honestly wanting to serve Him. I, I'm pretty confident that everyone here would like to do that. Now, sometimes people get very excited about a certain way that they're planning on serving God, and, and it's something that they're excited about, and they want to do it, and they oftentimes won't even realize that what they're about to do is sinful. And, you know what? Would you want to do that? If you're, if you're looking to serve God, obviously you don't want to do anything wrong. You don't want to do something sinful. But here, here's an example of what I'm talking about. You're like, well, how can somebody do something that's a sin, that'd be transgressing God's law, but serving Him at the same, same time? How, how, what kind of example are you even talking about? Well, one example, this is what, what I'm going to focus on for the majority of the sermon, is I've known people who wanted to exalt God or, or um, you know, show their faith in God, 
by getting a tattoo. And turn, if you would, to Leviticus chapter 19. And you can say, yeah, but you know, their heart's in the right place. They want to do something good. They want to, say, publicly show on their skin with, with you know, printed either Bible verses or, or something that says that, that you know, they're following Christ. They say, what could possibly be wrong with that? And I, I could say, okay, you know what? Maybe they have good intentions, but good intentions, you know, the, the, path, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. There's a lot of well-intentioned people who are deceived altogether in following a phony religion. There's Muslims out there that are well-intentioned, and they think that they're serving God, and they're not. And they're going to go to hell with that. There's, there's Catholics, there's other Christians, there's people who, who you can look at and say, well, they're very well-intentioned. Yeah, but they're going to go to hell if they don't have Christ, if they're not saved. So just because you have good intentions doesn't mean that it's, some, that it's something that you should do or that God's not going to treat it as a sin. The Bible actually explicitly tells us that getting a tattoo is wrong. It's sinful. It's not something that anybody should do. And it's very clear. We're going to see from Leviticus chapter 19 where it says that. Now, I'll admit, I'll be the first to admit, the Bible doesn't talk over and over again about tattoos as if this is like the worst sin you could ever commit. But it's written here in two places. We're going to see both of them. And that's enough for me. It can be written one time in one place in the Bible, especially in God's law, and that should be enough for me to say, okay, well, I'm not going to do it because the Bible says it's, it, we shouldn't do it. Look at Leviticus 19 and verse number 27. The Bible says, Ye shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. So we see there in verse 28, he's saying not to print any marks upon you, upon your body. He doesn't want any marks printed on you, which is exactly what getting a tattoo is. For one, it's also cutting in your flesh, because the way that they do the tattoo, they have to cut into you a little bit and inject the ink in order for the tattoo to stay permanent on your body. You say, oh, but that's a cutting in your flesh for the dead. Okay, jump over a couple chapters of chapter 21. Look at Leviticus 21 and verse number 5. We're going to see the same thing, except this time it says, They shall not make baldness upon their head, neither shall they shave off the corner of their beard, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. And notice this time it doesn't mention for the dead, it just says not to make any cuttings in your flesh. Um, between that and the not printing any marks upon you, this is where it's found in the law. And this is where we can see it and say, you know what, this is what God said. He never changed his mind later and said, you know what, actually, that's not against the law anymore. Um, that was just for the Old Testament. Jesus never said that's fine. And you can say, wait, 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 you know, why does God really care? Do you think God really cares about the way I look? Well, yes, actually, he does. He's talking about your hair, your, hair, your beard. He's saying not to mar the corners of your beard. And, you know, you can argue about what that means. But he, this is talking about our appearance. The Bible talks about a female's appearance being one that's with, um, that's with sobriety and shamefacedness. And that's not, um, that's not immodest. It should, you know, a woman should have modest, be dressed in modest apparel. God cares about the way that we look. The Bible talks about you know, men not having long hair, and they ought to have short hair, and that women should have long hair and not short hair. God cares about these things. They're written in the Bible. Now, is that the most important thing? No, of course not. As I mentioned, that's why I started off with Romans 10, saying, look, the most important thing is that salvation, because... All of these works of the law, when you're saved, no. you're not going to be held accountable no. of paying a punishment of yeah. hell for your yeah. sins once yeah. you're saved. That's why Christ is the, is the end of the law once you're saved by faith. Yeah. But, again, it doesn't just mean that, yeah. oh, okay, well, because I'm saved, now I don't have to obey any of God's commandments because I'm saved. Because the law is yeah. just gone and that there is no more sin, there is no more law. Yeah. That's not the way it works. We ought to have respect and reverence and love the law of the Lord. And if it says it in the Bible, you know, we ought to be able to just recognize it and say, okay, this is a sin. Now, obviously, if the Bible says something's a sin, that should be the end of the matter. I should be able to just 
close the server area and be like, okay, case closed. Getting a tattoo is wrong. I saw it from the scripture, and that settles it for me. And, you know, hopefully you have that type of a mindset and that type of an attitude where you can read the scripture, you can look at the verses and say, you know what, this is clearly saying that, that yes, I shouldn't do that, so I'm not going to do that anymore. Or I'm not going to do that. I was planning on doing that in the future. I'm going to change my mind now. But one thing I've noticed, especially with certain sins, I believe there's certain sins that are more closely tied with rebellion. For example, rock and roll music actually promotes rebellion against all kinds of authority. Rock and roll music, you listen to the lyrics and even just, just the songs themselves, they go against God. Oftentimes they're against a traditional family structure where, you're, where people are sleeping around and committing adultery and having these kids and this is what they're singing about and promoting and even against the government and, and against any type of government. Rock and roll is, is this music, and that's why, you know, in the, in the 40s and 50s, there was, a, at least a, America projected this image of having strong family values and traditional family values. And then in the 60s and the 70s, with the drugs and the rock and roll music, there was this big push against yeah. traditional family values because of this, um, you know, this music really had a, a lot of influence on the young generations back in the 60s and 70s that was promoting rebellion against the norm, against the traditional, against what the Bible would say is, a, is the way that we ought to be having our families and the way that people ought to be living in decency and morality. And I found that many people that get tattoos are also being rebellious. The same way that, that you could have this spirit of the rock and roll music that's going to lead you to be rebellion, rebel against your parents, rebel against all, any type of authority. Oftentimes, and again, I, I might be you know, painting with kind of a broad brush here, but the stereotype on people who get tattoos are ones who generally are, are acting out in rebellion in one way or another. You think about the bad boy image that people would project today. Oh yeah, he's a real bad boy. I guess, I don't know, um, I hear because there's ladies that I work with um, from time to time that, that, that like to talk about the TV shows and things, and I haven't watched TV in a, in a really long time, but I guess there was this show like Sons of Anarchy, and there's a guy there that everyone thinks is just so hot and, and whatever, that all the ladies Goo and go over. And but first of all, by the way, that's wickedness because these ladies are married, and nobody who's married, and even if you're not married, you shouldn't just be ogling over a man or a woman and just lusting after that person and saying, oh wow, that person's so you know beautiful or attractive or hot or whatever you want to use, and just having this lust in your conversation or in your heart and in your mind when you're looking at someone when you're married, shame on you. How do you think your husband, your spouse is going to feel about that? And oftentimes these days in marriages, you have the husband and the wife both just out doing that and saying that, oh yeah, well whatever, they don't care. You know why they don't care? Because they don't love their spouse that much. I love my spouse, I love my wife. You know, I would be very angry if I found out that she was lusting after some other guy. You say, oh, but there's no way that anything would ever happen because this is some movie star and you know, our paths are never gonna cross. I don't care. I don't care if it's never going to happen. I don't want her heart departing from me and lusting after some other man. But anyways, you have this, this character, this guy, and of course, you know, he's got the long hair, and he's going to, I don't even, actually, I don't know if this guy that they're talking about has a long hair or not, but um, I did see that, you know, they have the tattoos, he's in a biker gang, and all this other stuff, and that's the bad boy image. This is the bad boy image that's out there. It's one of rebellion, and there's always linked tattoos with that. Many people get tattoos to project a certain image about them. They want to look a certain way. And, and it makes sense. I mean, you think about even the clothes that you put on, every time you get dressed, you're projecting some sort of image about yourself. It tells you a little bit, it tells other people a little bit about you, the way that you dress, 
the way that you you groom yourself, and if you have tattoos and things like that, you're 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 informing people that this is something about you. Now, <clears throat> there's a, a specific example that that I could think of with this rebellion and uh, and the tattoo issue. There was someone who used to come to our church and. Um, you know, he got saved and was growing, and I had showed him already a lot of things that, you know, for some young Christians might be a little bit difficult to accept because they're hard truths from the Bible about, you know, getting married and divorce and remarriage and a lot of things that a lot of people might have a hard time with. And, and when you're a, a carnal Christian or new in the faith, some things might offend people. And, and want to get back to the world, and, and they don't want to follow that type of a path of obedience in God's Word. But this man was, you know, was making some real good steps and would, would hear he had a humble attitude for a while and would receive the preaching, receive God's Word, and started making changes in his life. And then one day he came in and had mentioned how he wanted to get this tattoo about God. And, had, and some some kind of phrase that he wanted to have, and um, you know, because I love him, I didn't just say, "Oh, okay," and just let him go and do it, because I know that it's a sin. So even though I could see he had his heart set on this, and it's something that he wanted to do, I had to tell him the truth, and I and I, and I you know tried to gently show him and say, "Hey, you know, you haven't done it yet. Before you do it." Let me just show you something from the Bible. Can I just show you something? He's like, yeah, but it's probably not going to make a difference. And I'll tell you right now, when you have an attitude like that, the, the backsliding has already begun. And I showed him. I showed him what we just read here. I showed him Leviticus 19. I showed him. I said, this is what the Bible says. You know, I said, you, you're going to do what you're going to do, but... I, the Bible says that it's sin, it's wrong, you shouldn't do it. And after service, he left and hasn't been back since. And um, decided that that's what he wanted to do. And he had that spirit of rebellion and rebellion against God's word. And it was, it's sad because, like I said, I had seen him grow and, and he had made some changes. He got baptized, he did all these things. But... For whatever reason, he really liked that tattoo and that tattoo idea and just, just decided to start straying from God's Word. And hopefully he's going to church somewhere. I don't know. I have no idea. I've tried to contact him and get a hold of him multiple times. But um, he hasn't been back since. But you know what? God's Word doesn't change. And if I had to do it all over again, I would absolutely do it because... I'm not doing anybody any favors by not telling them the truth. He had an opportunity to change his mind upon hearing God's word. And he decided not to do it because he was already had a rebellious heart. And this is the whole point of, of the sermon tonight too, by the way. If you're sitting there and you have, you, know, you have a tattoo or if you've done this before in your life, look, the, the point is not to just start making you feel bad about, the, about something that you can't do anything about. It's to inform, first of all, inform you that it is wrong and sin, so to prevent you from doing it again in the future, and especially for my children to hear this and understand, hey, getting tattoos are wrong because the Bible says so in Leviticus 19 that we just read, that God doesn't want us printing any marks upon our body so they don't have to make those mistakes when they grow up. Now, thank God, I thank God I never, I never did get a tattoo, but I just thought they were kind of stupid and I didn't want something like that on my body for the rest of my life. I didn't understand that they were wrong from the Bible. I didn't know it was a sin. But it is. And that's why we're preaching this sermon tonight, is that people can, um, can understand that. Now, another thing I find kind of funny about tattoos and with people getting tattoos is that, you know, you talk to people and say, oh, you know, they, they want to be so unique and so original, and they're going to get a tattoo to show how unique and original that they are, and, and um, you know, that they're going to stand out just like everyone else with tattoos. Yeah. It's not like you're the only one. There are so many people out there with tattoos, and I just think about how many people are out there 
You know, how many women out there these days have that tramp stamp, right? They like to show off that tattoo where they're showing their nakedness or practically showing their nakedness from the backside okay. and um, something that they're never even going to see. But it's something that they're just showing to other people that tells them a little bit about what type of a woman they are. And, um, or the, the, the men, they get the vines on their arm, right? The, the ones that wrap around their arm. It's like everybody has that. Why, why, why would you do it? You're just copying and following other people. You think you're being so unique and so original. Oh, no, I want to have these vines wrapped around my arm. Everybody has that. The Bible says in, in Exodus 23, 2, it says, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. So just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean that you should do it too, is what that verse is saying. Now, there's an entire culture out there. And they're not only into the tattoos, but they're also into piercings. Now, I'll say right off the bat, first of all, I think that jewelry in general for women is fine. As long as they're, you know, remaining modest. And I'm talking about, you know, necklaces, bracelets, earrings, things like that. On um, women are fine, and I, could, and, I, and I could show from the Bible why I believe that. Um, in the book of Proverbs and, and elsewhere in other places, talks about you know, women wearing jewelry. It's not a bad thing. It's not a sinful thing. I do believe that, that, that it, it all needs to be done in modesty. Something that's not so flashy and is drawing attention to you. But um, I don't believe it's a problem for women to wear jewelry. But what I do think is a problem are the men that wear earrings. And to me, this is just weird. Now, when I was growing up, you know, when, when a, a man, you see a man walking around with an ear, earring, the first thing I thought of is a fact. Okay, that guy's queer because he's got an earring. And there was always these rules. I heard kids in school say, oh, oh, well, if it's in your left ear, you're okay, but not if it's in your right ear, and all these different things. And I was just like, I don't care what ear it's in. You look like a girl. You look like a queer because you've got an earring in your ear. What in the world does any man want an earring in his ear for? I can understand the women. You know, they want to look pretty. But you, oh, man, what? Do you want to look pretty, too, just like the women? Do you want to be effeminate and, and, and start to look and dress and attire yourself like a woman? So you're going to put little jewels in your ears? Give me a break. Men need to start acting and dressing and, and being more like men instead of trying to mimic the jewelry and the appearance that, that women have. Well, let's see what the Bible says about men and earrings. Because look, if you would, at Genesis chapter 35. Genesis 35, there's not very, you know, and again, I'm not going to say that the Bible says if you're a man and you wear an earring, it is definitely a sin and it's against God's law. But it is against God. You know, God wants a separation between the genders. God wants you. That's why he has a short hair on men and long hair on women and not to be cross-dressers. And that's why the Bible says that a man should not wear that which pertains to a woman, neither a woman found a man's garment. For all that do so, our abomination, God wants us dressed different. He wants our hair looking different. And God doesn't want us in any way trying to, to, to blend how men and women should dress or act or look. The roles are different. But look at Genesis 35. We're going to see an example here that's not very um, not a very good example for men to have earrings. Verse number 2 of Genesis 35 says, Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. And let us arise, and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. So Jacob talks to his household, he's saying, okay, it's time to get right with God. We're going to go make an altar unto the Lord. We're going to get right with God. So what we're going to do is, what, what I need you to do, we need to put away the strange gods, we need to be clean. I want you to change your garments. We're going to fresh start, and we're going to go and worship the Lord. So look at what they do. His, their response it says in verse 4, And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all their earrings 
which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. So that's kind of interesting. When Jacob says, hey, it's time to get right with God, we're going to get rid of these false gods. So what do they do? They say, okay, here's all our false gods, and by the way, here's our earrings. They associated these earrings as something that wasn't good, that wasn't going to be pleasing unto God. Look at Judges chapter 8. We're going to see something else very similar. Judges chapter 8. So we see Jacob's household, when they're getting right with God, got rid of those earrings. Judges chapter 8, verse 24. Judges 8, 24 says, And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you, that you would give me every man the earrings of his prey. And in parentheses it says, For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. So the reason why, so, you know, there was a battle. Right? And, and the men of Israel, Gideon, um, had defeated the army of, the, you know, the, the, this, other, this other army. And um, it says that the spoil, what they took from the bodies, what they took from their prey, is that they had golden earrings. And it says because they were Ishmaelites. So the fact that they were Ishmaelites is why they even had these golden earrings. Now, the sons of Ishmael, these Ishmaelites, are, were not followers of the Lord. They were heathen, and they had their own gods and their own religion, and I don't think it's a coincidence that the Bible adds this in here in parentheses, that the reason why they even had those earrings is because they were Ishmaelites. So, you, O oh Christian man that wants to get an earring, do you want to be like the heathen? Do you want to be like the Ishmaelites that had these earrings? I don't, that, doesn't, that doesn't look like a good example. Now, you're not going to find really any other or many other examples about earrings and men and stuff, but this is what we can find from the Bible. Now, I'm going to get off this, this topic of the earrings because, you know, the tattoo culture oftentimes when people do, it's not just the tattoos, you know, and obviously the earrings on, on men is one thing, but they take it a lot farther than that. Besides just the, what I would consider a regular piercing, which would be you know, women getting their ears pierced. But they do a lot more of like a mutilation of the body. You know, I'm thinking about the, not just the earrings, but where they have these big, um, I forget what they call those gauges in the ears that are designed to just spread the holes like really big. And some people have, I don't know if you've seen them, like the size of a half dollar just hanging around their ear. And they've got this big old gaping hole, and they're just stretching their skin around that. And, um, you know, people do the same, similar things in their eyebrows, in their nose, in their lip, in their chin, just all over the place. They have these pieces of metal sticking out of their face, and they have all these holes in their face, and in their body, and in their arms, and in their head. People are doing all kinds of weird things in distorting and mutilating their body. And it's wickedness. They look like they, they got their face smashed into a tackle box and they come up with all these lures and things and hooks just hanging out of the mouth and they think it out of their face and they, they think it looks good or they think they're cool or what I don't know what they think. Oh, I'm such a unique individual that I, I'm gonna start making holes in my flesh and putting pieces of metal in there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Turn if you want to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This is what the heathen do. This is what people who don't have God do. Now, the Christians should not be following that example. It's, it's, it's easier to understand how someone who doesn't know God, doesn't believe in God, can do these things. Because they don't know what they worship. But we know what we worship. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. The Bible says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God. See, in the Old Testament, they had the temple that was built. The old temple where they would go and worship. But in the New Testament, that's changed. We don't have that temple anymore. The Bible says that we are the temple of God. The Bible says that, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. This is something new for the New Testament, that God's Spirit actually dwells in you, and you are the temple of God. Your body is that temple. The Bible says in verse 17, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple 
ye are. Do you think God wants you taking your temple and starting to make all kinds of cuttings and piercings and holes and marks and just, just defiling that temple? The Bible says that God's going to destroy you. This is a serious warning for people to think, you know, and the bottom line is you say, well, you know, I don't understand why it's wrong. I don't understand why you'd want to do it in the first place. I have yet to hear any logical or sound reason as to why someone needs to start putting holes in their flesh and putting pieces of metal through. If you have any doubt about this from the Bible, you say, well, that's not very clear to me. Look, if you even have a, a little bit of a doubt as to, as to this being sinful or not, why in the world do you think that you need to do this to yourself? It doesn't make any sense. I think it's clear cut and dry in the Bible, but even if you have the, the, the smallest piece of doubt, Christian, don't go out and do these things. Don't get these weird piercings. Don't get these tattoos. It's a sin. And, you know, when God's saying that he's going to destroy the people that defile the temple of God, that's a serious warning. Flip, if you, if you would, over to chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18 says, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, obviously, I read verse 18 on purpose because... In context, he's talking about fornication and defiling your body that way with another person. But the concept still stands that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And that we are bought with a price that God has bought us. He's purchased us. This body doesn't belong to us just to do with it whatsoever we like. It belongs to God if you're saved. If you're born again, Christ's blood was shed for you. And now you belong to God. You're his. So it doesn't mean you could just go around and start cutting yourself and, and, and making all kinds of marks and imprints and, and pieces of metal striking through your flesh. That doesn't bring honor or glory unto God. In fact, it does the opposite. It puts you in like the heathen into what they do. You, do you know that these piercings and stuff, you know that this isn't new, right? People think that this is some new fad. And in America, it is a new thing. It's relatively new in the United States. But there's no new thing under the sun. These types of perversions and mutilations have been going on for millennia. These things have been going on in Africa for a very long time. In Asia and other, in other areas, people have been doing this stuff where they've been, where they've been um, you know, I, I remember seeing a documentary or read it in a book about the, the people in Africa that would keep putting rings under their head to stretch out their necks because I think they thought it was beautiful to have a really long neck. And they did all kinds of different things with the piercings and the nose and in the ears and doing these, these weird types of piercings as well. A lot of that came from Africa, where heathen people who worship false gods, who worship devils, were doing these types of things to themselves. Now, my last point that I want to make, turn if you would to Psalm 139. We need to be glorifying to God in all things. The way we present ourselves, the way that we look, the way that we act. But we need to understand, you know, we have this temple of God, but not only that, we are made by God. God made us the way that we are. Turn, if you would, to Psalm chapter 139, verse number 13. Psalm 139. We're going to start reading in verse number 13. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. 
How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. This is an incredible section of scripture here in Psalm 139, talking about where David's exalting the Lord, talking about how he's so wonderfully made. God has made and formed and fashioned every single person on this earth today. He's created that individual to be exactly the way that they are. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. God made you a certain way. Do we have some type of flaws that we perceive as flaws? Yes. Are we, are we made completely perfect in a sense of um, nobody ever has any physical ailments? No. But God made us for, for a specific reason. Now, <clears throat> we ought to be happy and content with the way that God made us. Some of us might be tall, some might be short, some you know, have a certain color hair and eyes and all these other things. We need to be happy. God made you that way for a reason. We don't need to be going out and trying to change those attributes about us the way that God made us. Our appearance. We don't need to be sticking pieces of metal or tattoos all over our skin. Hey, God gave you the skin that you have. God gave you the hair that you have. We need to be content with those things and understand that, hey, God thinks that you're beautiful. God made you that way. And he made you that way for a reason. The last place we're going to turn is John chapter number 9. John chapter number 9. It's a shorter sermon today. It's a real simple topic. But I wanted to just show you how the tattoos and the piercings and these things are wrong. But this applies to more than even just those couple of things. We need to be content with our appearance with the way that God made us, and that we don't need to start altering our things and dyeing our hair and doing all these various things to, to look different than the way that God made us. We ought to respect how much time and, and um, thoughts that God has toward us and that he has fashioned us in the womb and we're curiously wrought by him. John 9, verse 1. Now, God's made you that way for a reason. And we may not always know what that reason is, but I believe that there is a purpose for it. John 9, verse 1 says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. You say, oh, what about someone who's blind? Look what it says. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They're trying to figure out, well, why is this guy blind? Why does he have this defect? Why would that happen, God? Who sinned? Did he sin? Did his parents sin? Why is he born blind? And Jesus answered him and said, Look, it's not because of sin that he's born blind. Verse number three says, Jesus answered, Neither had this man sin nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. See, what we look at and perceive they say, well, this man's on perfect. Someone must have sinned. Someone screwed up. Someone did something wrong. God's saying, no. I had a different plan for this man in his life. And the reason why he was even born that way was to glorify God so that Jesus can heal him and everyone can see that God had, had performed this great miracle. That God performed this great miracle on a man who was born blind to give that much more honor and glory unto God. And I've seen, in the past, I've seen, um, there's a, a girl that I knew that had Down syndrome. And you can say, well, why, you know, why does God allow these people to be born and have these defects? You know what that girl did? She was a soul winner. Now, obviously she had some limitations on on some of the things that she could comprehend and understand, but she knew enough to give the gospel. And I'll tell you what, I think she was able to reach people that many other people would never be able to reach. Because when you have someone that comes up to you that, that has, that has a, you know, a, a disability like that, and they're trying to talk to you, oftentimes people who would never give me the light of day, they'd never give me the time of day, or my wife, or other people who you know, are quote-unquote normal, that say, oh, I never want to hear anything about the Bible from you. Because they just don't want to hear it. But if someone came up to them 
you know, that, that, that might move their heart a little bit and say, well, okay, here's someone, I'm going to listen to what they have to say, they're obviously really trying, I'm not going to be rude, I'm not going to be offensive, I'm going to listen to what they have to say. They can be used to reach people, all of us can. And you can reach different people, because God has made us a certain way in order to reach people like that. And um, can you please take her out of, out of the room for a minute? God has made us a certain way for oftentimes for reasons why we don't understand. Now, as I mentioned earlier, maybe you've made some mistakes in your life already. Maybe you've done, got some piercings, or some tattoos, or whatever. Look, the sermon isn't to just rub your nose in it. No, if you didn't know it was a sin before, and you see that it is now, you should confess it to God and say, God, I've sinned. I'm sorry. I'm not going to do it again. Just forsake it and be done with it. And God will, will forgive you for that, and you can just move forward. It's not, you know, the sermon isn't designed to just make you feel horrible about yourself and, um, and not be able to live with yourself or something like that. You just need to be able to recognize it and say, okay, I'm not going to do it anymore. Because once it's done, there's nothing you can do about it. But mostly, this sermon is for those that haven't made the mistake yet, that are hearing this sermon, they can understand, you know, I'm not going to get caught up in the world and the world's thinking and think, oh, wow, those tattoos, those beards, oh, they're so cool, look at that person, look how, look how um, cool that looks on them. I, I want to do the same thing. No, we shouldn't do that. Be happy with the way God made you. God made you beautiful from the womb. And we ought to just be able to realize that and um, love God for that and, and appreciate what you have and what God has given you. Let's bow our eyes and a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to, to hear your word. God, I pray that you would please just, it seems like it's a very simple topic to understand, and I pray that... Uh, that people would learn from this message and understand that, that even, if, even if they're getting a tattoo that has scripture on it, Lord, that you said that you didn't want us to print marks upon us and that we should just listen to, your, to what you've already told us about it and listen to your laws instead of thinking that we know better than what the Bible actually says and somehow think that you'll be pleased with it, dear Lord. We know that you are more pleased with our obedience than you are with these sacrifices that, that people think that they're making to you, dear Lord. Um, help us just to do things the right way, and that if we have a zeal that, that of serving you, that we can do it according to knowledge, dear Lord. We can do it according to what the Bible says, and not just come up with our own ways or copy the ways of the heathen to serve you, dear Lord. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.